Okay, well, welcome everybody to tonight's My Moon uh, and uh, My Moon Hangout with our partner Cosmo Quest. Uh, my name is Andy Shader. I'm at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston. And with us tonight is Dr. Catherine Nish from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, Catherine is a postdoc at, uh, at, uh, at Goddard, and uh, she's a member of the LRO Mini RF team, which is Mini Radio Frequency. Uh, which is a okay. radar on a LRO, and she's also an associate member of the Cassini radar team. So she's gonna, we're gonna chat with her tonight, talk about what 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 all that means, and uh, what what uh, what she does there at Goddard. Um, so Catherine, why don't you just start off just telling us um, what do you, what do you what do you do at Goddard? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, <laughs> no, um, so I am as as you mentioned, Andy, a member of the 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 Mini-RF team on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, so this is just one of seven instruments on board uh, LRO. Um, and, uh, and, and, so, and this, this spacecraft was launched in 2009 um, to, to increase our understanding of the moon for, for a few reasons. Mainly at the time, um, NASA was very interested in sending uh, humans back to the moon for exploration purposes. So this was a partnership between um, uh, the ex exploration side of NASA and the science p uh, part of NASA. Um, and, and, and we've just learned so much about the moon uh, with this new uh, spacecraft and several other uh, international spacecraft that have gone up around the moon. It's really been, uh, ushered in a, a renaissance in, in lunar science. Um, and, and one of the main focuses of, of LRO was uh, to look for resources for astronauts, one of the most important being uh, <clears throat> ice, for example. So um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard, um, but very recently the MESSENGER spacecraft around Mercury um, confirmed that there's large deposits of water ice near the poles of Mercury, which seems kind of crazy given that Mercury is the hottest um, you know, planet in the solar system. Um, but it turns out uh, Mercury, just like the Moon, has these places uh, called permanently shadowed regions near the poles where it gets cold enough uh, to trap volatiles like, like water ice and other, um, other things that are normally uh, in a vapor phase on, on these planets. So, so one of the main points of LRO was to look at the poles to determine if there's water there and, uh, and how much there might be. Um, and the way we, we help with mini RF is it turns out that uh, large deposits of water ice have very unusual radar signature. So we're, we're basically taking a big radar flashlight and pointing it at the poles of the moon um, to see if there's any bright radar return there that might be indicative of ice. Um, so that, that's one of the things I do. Um, and there are plenty of other instruments on board LRO that were also put there to help us um, understand whether or not there's ice there. And of course we all talk to the other, other teams and try to come up with sort of a, a whole picture about the moon and what's going on there. Uh, so that's that's what I do in a nutshell. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, if those of us, or I'm sorry, those of you that may have just jumped on recently uh, during the middle of Catherine's talk, a uh, little bit there, uh, we're talking with Dr. Catherine Nish from the NASA Guard Space Flight Center. She's on the uh, Mini RF team, uh, instrument team on, on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And I just want to remind everybody that uh, if you have any questions um, for Catherine, you can uh, put that either on our the, the event page uh, for this hangout uh, on YouTube if you're watching it on YouTube, or via the Twitter hashtag uh, #MyMoonLPI, all all one word, and you can see it there on my under my name there in the lower third. Uh, so yeah, Catherine, Catherine, that's that's a great point you brought up about LRO that it's it, it was really this cross between si bringing science and exploration together, and in fact that's um I think that's it's it's mission's motto or something. It's on like the the logo I think for LRO, but it's like in Latin. Possibly, uh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so have you have you obviously you're doing some of the science for us. Have you done anything in terms of the exploration? I mean, right. like you said, they're, they're 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 together, which so it's kind of yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah, they are very complementary. Um, so one thing that NASA was very interested um, during the exploration phase of the mission uh, was to look for certain landing sites. Um, uh, they were called constellation regions of interest because at the time uh, the program to go back to the moon was called constellation. So um, a group of scientists got together and chose 50 different sites on the moon. Um, they're top 25 and they're bottom 25. Um, so tier one and tier two. 
Uh, and so one of the things LRO focused on specifically in its, the early part of its mission was to, to look at these 50 sites to determine um, both their interest to scientists, um, but also their um, la any landing hazards you might find, um, resources in that area. Uh, so one of the things that I've, I've done is to take a really close look at those um, areas in radar. Um, in addition to being very good at finding deposits of water ice, radar is very, very sensitive to, to rocks. Um, rocks of about centimeters to maybe about as big as a meter. Um, so this would have been great for Neil Armstrong uh, back in Apollo 11 to know, you know where to put his spacecraft down. Um, and actually he had to do this on the fly when he noticed there was this huge um, boulder field that he was originally intended to land in, um, and he, he knew that he had to fly over that and, and touch down somewhere safer. So now with LRO, we can, we can determine where those safe landing spots are in advance. So um, that's, that's one of the things we can do with radar, um, as well as some of the other instruments on LRO. There's also a very high-resolution high camera uh, called the LRO camera, or LROC, um, and they're able to see um, things as small as a meter in size. So so a combination of these instruments can help us find safe landing sites for future um, manned trips to the moon. Excellent. So, so the mini RF, the radar could. So if if I'm hearing you right, the resolution limit of LROC is about a meter. Anything <laughs> maybe smaller than that is a little iffy. So we could use uh, mini RF to. Uh, I guess maybe uh, right. I'm not sure what I'm looking for, but to, well, yeah, to... smaller rocks. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I see here. I was trying to use like some fancy word, and I just couldn't think of it. Right. But yeah, small, <laughs> smaller rocks. Okay. Ex excellent. Um. So Paul Spudis, I believe, is the PI. Uh, he, for, uh, uh, he was the PI of the of the instrument on Chandrayaan One. Okay. Which was, uh, the Indian um, partner. Um, that, that spacecraft unfortunately died in 2009. The PI of Mini RF is uh, Ben Bussey, who's at right. the physics lab uh, right. in uh, Columbia, Maryland. Okay. So, actually, so you bring that, bring that up. What's both Mini RF and Mini SAR or radar? Yeah. Um, but what's the difference between them? Um, so, Mini SAR, which was the instrument on Chandrayaan 1, uh, was meant to be uh, sort of a a test, a test run for mini RF, so it was a little bit simpler. Um, actually, we 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 also called it Forerunner because it was the forerunner to mini RF. Um, so it only had one wavelength at one resolution, and the resolution was rather low. It was 150 meters. Um, with mini RF, we had two wavelengths, um, 12 centimeters and 4 centimeters, and we had two resolutions: um, the 150 meter resolution, but also uh, we had a zoom mode, which which showed us features as small as 15 meters. So, and that really has helped us understand the moon a lot better. You get that tenfold increase in resolution. Suddenly, you can see uh, features that um, weren't visible before. Um, so, most of the data we got with Mini RF are at that 15 meter resolution. Great, very good. Um, and I'll ask one more question, and we'll um, see maybe if there's anything over. In our view, any of our viewers have a question, but um, when, when a lot of things first started coming out, a lot of the data started coming out. I heard this term called circular polarization ratio. Yeah. Now I have no idea what that means, and I have tried to understand that. Is <laughs> is it really that complicated, or is no, there a really simple way to explain what this is? Very simple. It's very simple. Unfortunately, it has the acronym CPR, so it sounds like you're doing emergency <laughs> medical, you know, assistance with somebody. Um, but all it is is uh, is a ratio. So just like you know, the simple math you learned in grade school, where you take one number, you divide it by another number. Um, so so CPR, you take um, one type of radar with one polarization, and you divide it by another type of radar with the opposite polarization. So uh, electromagnetic waves have a certain polarization. Um, in radar, we like to talk about uh, circular polarization. So you can imagine a, a wave going through space like a circle. So that would be one polarization. If you go the other way, uh, that would be the opposite polarization. So what we're measuring is just the ratio of those two things. Um, and it turns out that that ratio, just those two polarizations, can tell you an awful lot both about the presence of ice on the moon, but also um, the roughness, those, those rocks I was talking about earlier. Um, 
and it has to do with how uh, electromagnetic waves interact with, with surfaces. Um, it turns out that when you bounce a wave off a surface, um, it will go from this direction to this direction. Oops, I can't see that. <laughs> the opposite direction. Um, and that tells you uh, something about the surface. If the polarization doesn't change, um, that tells you either it bounced twice, um, and so you probably have a lot of really big blocks on the surface that would cause it to bounce twice, or um, it never bounced at all and it just went through ice. So, uh, so that's, that's why we use this, these ratios to tell us something about the geology uh, uh, on the moon. So w w just real, real quick, where you, where you said how if it looks like it bounced twice, that means there was like, it's like a big boulder. Is, is, this, is this, do you know this because of doing similar things on the Earth? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually there's a great analog on the Earth. Um, it's called SP Flow. It's in, uh, it's in northern Arizona. Uh, if anybody's going up to the Grand Canyon, you can make a bit of a detour um, and see this wonderful lava flow that's basically made up of radar-sized blocks. <laughs> um, so just imagine, you know, 20-centimeter-sized blocks all stacked on top of each other that made up this lava flow. Um, so what you're getting is a bunch of corner reflectors. So you get the radar bouncing off, uh, hang on, let me see if I can get that. <laughs> <laughs> twice off the blocks. Um, and so you get, it's called double bounce backscatter. Um, and, and this, this, ra this lava flow in northern Arizona has enormous circular polarization ratios. Um, and, but there's no ice there. So clearly there's, there's more than one way to, to cause these these high uh, ratios. Um, so yeah, so we use terrestrial analogs all the time to help us understand what's going on on the moon. It's okay. been very helpful. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah, I've sat on that on that lava flow. It's yeah, it hurts. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we we have a couple of questions from our viewers. Uh, Michael asks, uh, can radar detect live meteor strikes, and if so, was there any detected? Um, you know, I think they use that in the Earth's atmosphere um, to look for, for for meteors striking the Earth. Um, I don't know too much about that, but uh, that you can see within the in the terrestrial atmosphere. Um, in terms of the Moon, uh, I think I don't think you you'd be able to use radar uh, to see that. They're so infrequent; um, it's very unlikely. I think we won't be able to see that at all. Although we do. Um, we do have some folks looking for new impact craters on the moon, so they're taking uh, pictures that we took in the 70s with Apollo and comparing them to brand new images that were just taken by LRO, so you've got a time span of about 30 years there. Um, and you can find new impact craters that weren't there 30 years ago but are there today. Um, and so that's one way we can, um, not radar, but the LRO spacecraft can help us to understand how many objects are striking the moon in the present day. Cool. Uh, another question from Eve. So I think this is in reference to CPR. Uh, so it is kind of like dual polarization. Uh, so is it kind of like dual polarization in weather or Doppler radar? Meteorologists use this to determine types of reflectors, that is rain, droplets versus ice crystals or, ha or hail, etc. Is this a similar idea? Uh, possibly. You know, I don't know a lot about uh, weather radar. Um, but the principles are, are the same. You're taking a signal and you're bouncing it off raindrops or hail or, or whatnot and, and receiving a signal. Um, but I, don't, I, I, I guess I don't know enough about the different signatures from rain versus hail uh, to say if it's the same thing, but um, it certainly seems plausible. Uh, terrestrial radars like, like weather radars or radars that track uh, airplanes, very similar concepts. Uh, the only difference really is the scale involved. Um, with terrestrial radars, you're only going out, you know, hundreds of miles at most, whereas um, with planetary radars, you have to be able to span, um, you know, uh, astronomical units um, in some cases. So you need really, really powerful radars. Uh, that's, that's, that's the big difference. Uh, but in general, that they're, they're very similar uh, in concept. Yeah, see, and you did some of that uh, work with bouncing radars across distances of astronomical units when you were in, in a, well, you were an intern at Arecibo? Right, yeah. For, for yeah. a summer? I, I, yes. I, I worked at Arecibo uh, Telescope, uh, largest radio telescope in the world down there in Puerto Rico, and they've used that to um, 
to look at objects as far away as Saturn, uh, Saturn and its moons. So that's uh, eight astronomical units away. Um, so these radars are very powerful and, and can see very large distances. Um, you know, if, with LRO, you're only, say, 50 kilometers above the surface. It seems easy by comparison. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for your questions, Michael and Eve. Hopefully, we'll get some more uh, uh, here in, in, a, in a little bit, unless maybe we have some now. Um, so you study impact cratering. Um, I don't know specifically what you have. That seems to have been kind of a focus. Um, so are there any, or, or maybe the question is, what are the advantages to using radar to study impact cratering versus visual imagery or even topography data? Right. Um, well, radar has a big advantage um, in that it can see below the surface. Uh, not very far. At the wavelengths we're talking about, you can see maybe a meter or two below the lunar surface. Uh, so this allows us to see blocks and features that uh, you can't see with optical imagery, because with optical imagery, all you're detecting is the very top, you know, micron or nanometer of the surface. Uh, and with radar, you're, you're probing underneath all that dusty regolith on the top of the surface to see blocks or um, uh, melt that's formed in impact craters. So uh, one of the things in particular that I've been doing is uh, using radar to uh, detect new impact melt flows on the moon, um, which might be buried over time. Uh, so impact melt is something that's commonly formed in, in, in impact cratering events when the, the projectile hits the surface, uh, generates you know, very high, high pressures and temperatures, and the substrate melts. Um, and it turns into a, essentially a short-lived lava flow um, that can then spill out over the sides of the crater um, and produce produce these, these melt flows. Um, but they degrade pretty quickly over time, um, so you might not be able to see them with optical imagery, but with radar where you can pr probe beneath the surface, you can detect them very easily. So that's one of the things, uh, one advantage radar has over optical and studying impact craters. Okay, that's well, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a good advantage to have. Uh, and Nick, Nick asked a question, which has more ice now? I'm not sure what he means by now, but which ice has which which has more ice now, the north or south of the moon? You know, we don't know the answer to that question. Um, I could make some guesses, but um, from the data we have now, uh, it's it's not entirely clear. Um, so, un unlike Mercury, the moon isn't quite uh, as bright in radar, um, but there are a few interesting craters. Uh, near the north and south poles that, that, that do have this intriguing radar signature that might have ice in them. So if we're basing it on, on that measure alone, um, I would say there's probably more unusual craters near the north pole of the moon. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Elcross spacecraft, which is the only uh, spacecraft to, to directly detect water ice on the moon uh, by impacting it, um, this happened in October of 2009, um, it, it, it was aimed towards the South Pole. Um, so we have a very good idea of one place on the South Pole and how much water ice is there, and it looks like there's about 5 weight percent. Um, but there hasn't been a comparable mission to the North Pole of the Moon. Um, and again, that's just one spot on the South Pole. So I'd say right now it's, it's hard to tell. Um, but if I had to guess, I'd probably, I'd probably go looking at the, the North Pole. Um, it, there seem to be a lot more promising candidates up there. And what do you mean when you say the moon's not as radar bright? Um, so, so ice has a very bright radar signature. Um, and you see this on Mercury very, very plainly. Um, there are craters there that are in constant permanent shadow, uh, which are very bright in radar return. And Messenger has confirmed that these, these craters are, in fact, filled with, with water ice. Um, there is uh, evidence from a uh, neutron spectrometer that this is consistent with water ice. Uh, neutron spectrometers are, are detecting the amount of neutrons coming off the surface of a planet. And since hydrogen has the same mass as neutrons, um, where you have hydrogen, you have less, less new, uh, neutrons. Because uh, just like billiard balls, when they hit each other, um, that neutron's going to lose all its energy when it runs into a hydrogen. Um, so, so we see both this bright radar signature, but also this very low neutron count 
um, which tells us there's definitely uh, water ice in those craters uh, on Mercury. Uh, on the Moon, you also see that low neutron count, um, but the, the resolution of the instruments isn't perhaps as good enough to, to pinpoint the individual craters uh, on, near, the, near the poles of the Moon. Um, so this is where you'd want the radar to help you sort of get that higher resolution imagery. Uh, unfortunately, the craters on the Moon do not seem as bright as they do on Mercury, which either means that um, there isn't uh, as much ice there, or it's broken up into little chunks, um, or, or it's buried so deeply that we can't uh, see it. Although, if that was the case, we wouldn't be able to see it with the, the neutron spectrometer either. So I think what's happening is that um, uh, there just isn't as much ice near the poles of the moon, and what ice is there is broken up into little, little pieces that wouldn't be bright to radar like they are on Mercury. So, so we, okay, so, so when you say something is, is radar bright, does that mean like it's, 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 it looks bright? Yeah. Like, yeah, like, like there's a lot of light bright. coming from it? Well, it's, it's your own reflected light. So you, you take your radar flashlight and you shine it at these craters, and what you're getting is just that light reflected straight back at you. Um, so that's what you're seeing. Okay. But it's and not like, it's not bright like visual light. It's, it's bright in radar, radar. Yeah. which is radio waves. Right, right. Because yeah, if you're so looking at a permanently shadowed area of the moon, you're not going to see any light. Oh, no, no, yeah, it's going to be yeah. very dark. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> dark optically, bright in radar. <laughs> right, okay. Because so, radar is, you, like I said, they're flashlights. You're bringing your own power source, whereas optical imagery, you're relying on the sun to see inside those craters. And since the sun never shines in those craters, you don't see the craters in visible light. Right. You need a really big flashlight <laughs> to see inside <laughs> those craters. Like the sun, but it just but doesn't work. But in a different place. Right. <laughs> you can move the sun to a different place <laughs> in the sky. Okay, I think we've got a couple of more, or at least one more here. Um, what transmitting power do you need for having good signal-to-noise with these bodies like moon, uh, Mercury, Venus, or Titan? I think it's like a megawatt. I could be wrong about that. Um, yeah, something like a megawatt. I'd have to double-check, but that's what's coming to mind straight away. Um, yeah. So we do sometimes have problems with Arecibo where the transmitter fails, um, and then you're, you're not able to, uh, to, to see uh, anything, really. Uh, but when it's working, um, you've got quite a powerful radar there. <laughs> they actually um, shut down the road that circles the, the telescope. So it's about a kilometer around, or um, 300 meters across. And when the radar is on, uh, they actually um, there's some lights that, that are flashing at the observatory telling people not to go to go down there. Because um, oftentimes people will go down there to go jogging or to take a walk. Um, but they don't want you to be microwaved. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when the radar is operating, they, they advise that you not go down there. Wow. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for that. From Sylvan, looks like maybe they jumped over from Learning Space to come to our Hangout. So thank you for doing that. that that's great. Um, so um, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe, maybe you know this. Me know better about this, but it seems like maybe the use, it appears as though the use of radar on spacecraft maybe is becoming more popular or has it always been there and has just kind of been lost in the background to like the visual imagery and and spec, spectroscopic data? No, actually radars have been relatively rare and I think the reason for that is they were quite big and heavy and and consumed a lot of power. Um, and so if you have a spacecraft and you want to get as much data from it as you can, you're going to take the small, light, you know, uh, instruments that don't require as much power. Uh, so back in the 90s, one of the big missions then was Magellan, which was a, a radar mission to Venus. And there it made perfect sense to have a radar because you can't see through the clouds uh, of Venus with optical imagery. But the whole spacecraft was a radar. It was big and heavy and used up a lot of power. Um, what I think we're seeing now is that radars have improved to the point 
where you don't need the entire spacecraft to be a radar. Um, MINI-RF is just one small instrument on, on, on LRO, and there are you know, six other instruments on board. So you're not consuming your entire spacecraft with you know, just one instrument. Um, so I think just the, the technology advances has, has led to a bit of a renaissance in, in, uh, in radar technology. Because we use them all the time on the Earth. There's some very sophisticated radars that are currently orbiting the Earth. Um, the Earth is, in fact, the, the best studied planet in radar. Um, and so now I think people are looking at applying these technologies to other planets. Cool, very cool. Um, and going back to the um, um, the the water, the, the ice on the moon, because um, I've heard Paul Spudis has talked about there's three different flavors of water um, or ice <laughs> on, on the moon, and I think it has something to do with maybe how much water or like if it's like sheets of ice versus little bits of water is kind of mixed in with the regolith or if it's just like a little very light frosting kind of coating. Yeah, yeah. Does, can you, obviously I'm guessing you can tell that from its radar signature? Um, right, so there's only one of those three flavors can you actually see with radar, and that's the thick deposits. It has to be about a meter or so thick. Um, so I like to call that the skating rink um, type of ice. You need a thick <laughs> pile of it in order to see with radar. If it's small chunks or just a, a frosting, you're not going to see that with radar. You need other instruments uh, to see that. So where are they where are they coming up with these three flavors? How are they getting that data? Um, so I think what he's talking about there is is there were some uh, discoveries a few years ago that there is this um, OH layer kind of covering the entire entire moon um, that is is not very thick and, and you know you need an awful lot of it to make a to a cup of water for yourself to drink. Um, <laughs> so that's not a very useful resource for for man exploration. Um, then there's the sort of water that Elcross found when it impacted the south pole of the moon, uh, which we can't see with radar, so we know it's not this thick skating rink deposit of ice. Um, it's probably just small chunks or, or crystals of ice mixed in with the regolith. Um, so that, that's a better resource um, for humans, but it's, it's not as much as, as, as the thick deposits um, like we see on Mercury. Um, and, and what he's talking about is there are some craters near the poles that, that look like they might have the, the radar signature you'd expect for, um, for ice. Um, but it's not as clear as it is on Mercury, because um, as I mentioned earlier, there are other processes that can create this radar signature, the sort of like the SP flow sort of idea. Um, and so, so we're still actually, we're, we're undertaking some experiments um, using MINI-RF to try to tell the difference between ice and just blocky craters. Um, so I'm really looking forward to see the results from those experiments. Cool. Uh, Nick asks, are there are any future missions going to be carrying radar? So, for example, LADEE is the next lunar mission that launches this year. Um, none of the U.S. missions currently planned have, have radars, um, but there is a, a European mission going to the uh, Jupiter system called JUICE, um, which will be carrying an ice penetrating radar. So this is longer wavelengths than what we have with MINI-RF, but it should be able to see um, beneath the ice on Jupiter's moons Europa and Ganymede um, to try to see if there are any subsurface layers uh, of, of water there, um, which might be good places for life. Um, I'm hopeful that radars will be included in, in future missions that have yet to be planned. I would love to see a radar go to Mars, for instance, it seems amazing, given all the spacecraft we sent to Mars, that none of them have um, had a, an imaging radar on board. Um, there are two penetrating radars uh, called Mars's and Sherrod, which are more like the ice penetrating radar I was talking about earlier, and those have done some, some wonderful work understanding um, the ice deposits near the poles of, of Mars. Uh, but I'd love to see um, somebody send an imaging radar to Mars as well so we can... Um, compare Mars to the other planets where we have radar, like Earth, Venus, the Moon, um, and so forth. And what specifically would you, would you hope to, to learn by that comparison? Um, well, there's a few, few great things you could do with a radar on Mars. Um, first of all, Mars is covered in dust, um, sand and dust, which tends to obscure a lot of finer details. Uh, but like I said earlier, uh, radar can penetrate 
um, beneath that dust to see features below it. Um, and so on Mars, you might have ancient stream valleys that are currently covered in dust and sand that you can't see in the optical imagery that we already have. But if you send a radar there, you'd be able to pick them out really easily. Um, and we actually do this on Earth in the Sahara Desert. You can see um, streams that you wouldn't be able to see with optical imagery alone. Um, also, we've been talking a lot about ice and water. And uh, actually, water is very, very bright in radar. So you might be able to find some of these uh, temporal streams that we think might be occurring on Mars today, um, coming out of crater walls and so forth. Uh, those would show up really brightly with radar. Um, so there's a, a couple of different areas, I think, that would benefit from um, understanding uh, on Mars using an imaging radar. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Um, another thing that's come across here is, can, can you compare radar to laser altimetry? Um, well, they're similar, actually, techniques. Uh, with radar, we have our 12-centimeter flashlight. With laser altimetry, typically you have a one-micron flashlight. Um, and so, and they have different sort of purposes. Um, typically, the laser altimeter is used to uh, look, look at topography um, of the surface. Uh, and so LOLA is an instrument on board LRO, the Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter. And we've gotten amazing uh, topography uh, from that instrument. Um, and that's really helped us in our understanding of lunar geology. Uh, so you can do things like take the topography from, from LOLA and compare it to the radar signature we're getting from mini RF and, and under th understand things about impact craters or um, mountains or, or whatnot on the moon. Um, so uh, they're t similar techniques, um, very complementary. Um, and, and so, uh, yes, we, we do a lot of work comparing radar to laser altimetry data. Okay. Um, so uh, Catherine uh, did her PhD at the University of Arizona, uh, which actually is where I first, I first <laughs> met her when I was there also. And, and at U of A, you studied aqueous organic chemistry on Titan. Yeah. And, and now you have, <laughs> yeah, now you have a bachelor's in physics and astronomy. How, how do you go from that to, <laughs> to studying aqueous organic chemistry? How, 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 did you, how do you make that leap? You know, I think I've just been a very curious person. Um, and I love interdisciplinary science. Um, I love to see the connections between the different sciences. I think that's where all the exciting work really comes from. So um, as an under, undergraduate, you know, I saw, I saw that I was interested in planetary science. Um, and I saw that I was interested in understanding how chemistry related to geology, related to astronomy, and so forth. And so I think, I think that's where the leap, <laughs> leap came from, um, and just my interest in understanding um, the gaps between the sciences. Um, so, so I have a very broad interest. Um, I like to call myself a fake chemist and a fake geologist. Uh, I don't feel like I'm necessarily an expert in anything, but <laughs> you know, I think I think there's there's room for for people like me in science. <laughs> well, planetary science in itself is a very interdisciplinary exactly. field. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not it's not surprising. Um, I just, did you have did you have to take a lot of chemistry when you got to grad school? Or well, you, you know, have... it's it's amazing. I did take a few courses. But you realize how similar uh, the different sciences are, are. The different sciences are. For example, I took a physical chemistry course in graduate school, and I realized it was it was just the same as the the, the thermodynamics course I'd taken as an undergraduate. It's just pitched a diff slightly different way. Um, so the sciences aren't so different as you think when you start, um, you know, studying them in, in more detail. There's a lot of overlap. It's just a different way of describing the same process. Interesting, very interesting. Um, so, so like I said, you you do radar studies with the moon and with Titan. Um, when when you get some new radar data back, what what is the first thing that you look for in that um, data? So, uh, well, I guess Titan is a good example. Um, Titan is is Saturn's largest moon. Uh, and has a very thick atmosphere like Venus. So, uh, so for a long time we had no idea what was on its surface. Um, and then Cassini arrived in 2004, 
and was able to use the radar on board uh, to see what the surface looked like. And so back then, every radar strip we got in was just uh, new discovery after new discovery. And this is sort of my favorite thing about planetary science and especially working on missions. It's just you get to be an explorer um, in a way that, you know, I think we don't see as much on Earth. You know, back in the days when people were sailing around the world discovering new lands and and, and, and new, new species and whatnot. Um, you know, we get to do that as planetary scientists to this day. I mean, there are still places on Titan that we've never seen before. Um, and so every time we get a new radar strip from Titan, I just want to see what new and fascinating things we might find. Because um, Titan really surprised us. There were a lot of features there we weren't expecting to see. Um, you know, before Cassini, we thought maybe Titan had a, a large global ocean um, just covering the entire moon. And then instead we found, um, you know, seas of sand dunes around the equator and um, streams and small lakes near the poles. Um, so it really, it really surprised us. And so I love, I love the discovery aspect of, of planetary science. And, and that's, I don't know, that's what I do when I, when I find a new radar strip. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, anybody uh, out there uh, viewing out there? out there in the intranets. Anybody else have, have any questions or comments? Remember, um, you can do that if you're watching on, you can do it through YouTube, you can do it on the, on, the, uh, on our event page on Google Plus, uh, or you can do it through MyMoon, or I'm sorry, through Twitter, using the hashtag MyMoonLPI. <laughs> uh, so there's something from Nick saying, we get our own frontier era. That's true. Exactly. Yeah, I teed, a, I teed a course at the University of Arizona called The Golden Age of Planetary Exploration. Oh. And people kept asking me, well, what is the golden age of planetary exploration? And I think it's right now. I mean, the last 10 years have seen so many missions flying to so many different places, um, so many great discoveries, you know, from Mercury all the way out to, you know, in a few years, Pluto. Um, it, it's just been an amazing time to be a planetary scientist. I feel really lucky to be involved in these missions. Yeah, does um, it's New Horizons, does New Horizons have a radar on it? Or is it just a no. visual? No. No, there's yeah, cameras and, and whatnot, but no radar. Um, I, I was really saddened that Messenger didn't have a radar either. I would have <laughs> loved to see Mercury in radar, but, you know, they did an amazing job packing as many instruments on board that spacecraft as they could for, a, you know, $500 million budget. Right. So, you know, props <laughs> to the messenger team. Um, exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, so I read that you were uh, inspired by the Carl Sagan's novel Contact. Um, yeah, a little, little bit of a geek there. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's that's, a, that's okay. How how uh, how so? What what about the novel inspired you? You know, that's a good question. I think, I think in some ways, I saw myself in the main character, and you know, as a as a sixteen year old girl, there weren't a lot of role models to look up to at the time, um, and so, and and I saw that she was, you know, doing exciting science and traveling the world, and I thought that sounded amazing, and I wanted to do those things. Um, it seemed real, I guess. A lot of science fiction is. Uh, seems way out there, like it would never happen. You can't relate to it. But I felt like contact was relatable. It was in the present day, um, you know, with, with real people doing real science. It seemed like it could possibly happen. Um, so I think that's what really attracted me to contact and um, was probably the reason I applied for the internship at Arecibo, since Arecibo plays a large role in that book. Um, so, you know, it kind of had a pretty important role in my career since uh, since Arecibo is where I got introduced to radar, and the rest has sort of been history. Um, so yeah, so thanks to to Carl Sagan for inspiring me to uh, to be a radar scientist. Well, the thing about Carl is I'm sure he's in, not. I'm sure he has inspired quite quite a quite a few people. Uh, another question uh, from our viewers uh, from Keith: What is the diameter of the radar beam when aimed at Titan? Oh, I'd have to do some calculations. <laughs> For that, um, it's going to be a lot bigger than Titan, I guess, is, is the main point. Um, and so you're, you're, you're getting 
all of Titan uh, in a big radar beam. The only planet where you can really focus in on smaller regions is the moon, actually, from the Earth. Um, most of the time you can only see, say, one hemisphere or, um, or you're just consuming the whole um, planet. Um, so uh, it's, it's pretty large by the time it gets out, out to um, Saturn. Okay. Is it about the only planet? I don't. I don't comment, know. comment about the only planet. Oh well, that's okay. Uh, actually, I had a follow up to your, to the co question about uh, contact. So what? Oh, oh, I meant I meant the only the only planet. Oh sh shoot! You know I call moons planets all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, because they, they are worlds unto themselves, um, and it's it's you know I mean it's it seems kind of silly to differentiate between um, something that's orbiting another planet, something that's orbiting the sun. Um, really, if you're big and round, um, to me you're a world, you're a planet. Um, so, <laughs> so my apologies for that, but but I, I do that quite frequently because I you know if I was the IAU, I'd probably call a lot more things planets than are actually planets. <laughs> According to their rules. <laughs> well, you know, speak, speaking of that, when I see, I didn't get a chance to read it, but I saw something. I think it was today um, about Pluto may have up to ten moons. Did you see this? No, no. I mean, we know it has five moons, but uh, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're discovering new things all the time, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I think there are a lot more planets than eight in the solar system. I mean, you look at Titan; it's bigger than Mercury. It's got an atmosphere. It's got weather. Um, you know, if this thing wasn't orbiting Saturn, we'd definitely call it a planet. Um, so it just happened to form around Saturn. <laughs> so, right. And there's good reasons for why it's, it formed around Saturn, and it's not free-floating. But still, um, you know, if you, if you didn't see Saturn in the background, you would call that thing a planet, I think. Sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, if, if you're curious to know more about Pluto's moons, uh, on this Friday... Uh, the Cosmo Quest's weekly space hangout, they're going to talk about Pluto's moons. Uh, so if anybody out there listening is interested in that, check out the Cosmo Quest weekly hangout on Friday, weekly space hangout on Friday. Um, and uh, just real quickly to, I want to follow up again on the question about contact the novel. How is the novel compared to the movie? Um, yeah, the movie was pretty inspiring too. Um you know, because then you can see it in 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 person. Um, there were there were a few differences, obviously, between the two, um, but I think they I think they did a good job um, in expressing. Although it's very funny to uh, to see the part about Arecibo having actually lived at Arecibo and, and know <laughs> sort of where where they are and and uh, and how, how you know how unlikely some of the things that are happening would be, but you know. Sure, right. <laughs> well, I'll admit, I, I haven't read the book, but I did see the movie. Uh huh. Uh, and though I am not a scientist, I'm an educator, um, the movie really inspired me to yeah. get involved in astronomy and interested in astronomy. And then eventually the planets kind of took over uh, from there. Right. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a great story, I guess, no matter if it's the book or the, or the movie. Right, yeah. So, all right. Well, um, it looks like maybe our questions have kind of slowed down from, um, from our viewers. Um, so I want to thank you all uh, for uh, being a part of our Hangout tonight. We're talking uh, with Dr. Catherine Nietzsche from, um, uh, sorry, NASA's Guard Space Flight Center uh, in, in Maryland. Um, uh, in just a minute, uh, Catherine, I'm going to ask you for kind of a, any of your final comment. Uh, you might have uh, what we've talked about this evening or about anything you, you just want to say. Uh, and while she's thinking about that, okay. I just want to let everybody uh, who's online watching us tonight um, let them know about that tomorrow is the Planetary Society Hangout. Um, so go to their event page for more information about that. And Friday is the Weekly Space Hangout. And uh, can learn about everything over on the Cosmo Quest feed about all these upcoming hangouts uh, that are coming up. Um, the audio for this show will be on the 360, 365 Days of Astronomy podcast next Tuesday. Um, and of course, the recording of this, as we saw on YouTube, should be up uh, well tonight, probably. 
and we'll get this up as soon as we can uh, for tonight. So thank you for coming and sharing. And I also remind everybody that the next My Moon uh, Cosmo Quest Hangout will be, uh, I believe, on April 2nd. And we'll be talking to Will Pomerantz from Virgin Galactic, uh, some of that uh, commercial space commercial space biz that's, that's starting to take off. Um, so we'll just, I, I, will, I will stop with that horrible pun for the evening, and we're going to go back to Catherine and see what uh, any final, final comments that she has for this evening for you all. Well, I guess I'm, I'm drawn back to what we were talking about, the golden age of planetary exploration. And, um, and we've done a lot in the past, you know, 10 years plus to explore the solar system, but there's still so much we don't know. And so I really hope um, that the country and the world sees space as a priority um, to help us explore, um, be explorers, be discoverers uh, of new science and new worlds in our, in our solar system. Um, and beyond, um, because I think there's something innate in humanity to be curious and to want to search out new new places, and so I hope we continue to, to, to fund those programs in the future. Well, I would agree. So <laughs> thank you, Catherine, and thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight, and we hope to hope to see you again soon. Good night. Good night. Bye.